How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 41st video on the channel and today we're going to be continuing our 5th book, The Three Ecologies by Felix Guattari. In the last episode, we caught a glimpse of some of the concepts central to his understanding of subjectivity, like singularization, serialism, existential territory, and the molar molecular division. Here, we'll expand on those concepts and explore his notion of eco-logic. As a little disclaimer, Guattari has a tendency to jump from idea to idea very quickly, so sorry in advance if this video feels a bit disjointed at times. With the other way, let's get into it. Quartier begins this part of the essay by stating, The subject is not a straightforward matter. It is not sufficient to think in order to be, as Descartes declares. For him, it's rather that the subject is the product of a myriad of existential territories that overlap and shift like tectonic plates. If you haven't seen the last video or don't remember, these refer to all those zones of livable order extracted from chaos. For example, the home, friends, family, memories, and so on and so on. In a way, it's better to think about components of subjectification rather than of a subject as such. This is because Guattari's understanding of subjectivity isn't restrained to the individual level, like many other theorists would have it. Instead, it exists at the intersection of a veritable hodgepodge of elements. To use the metaphor of tectonic plates again, the subject is more like a ridge or a trench than anything else, the result of components colliding into each other, sometimes in conflicting ways. It's in this sense that Guattari sees the subject as more of a process. It's always in flux as different components come in and out of view, something we'll look at in more depth in just a little while. For now, Guattari is highly aware of the fact that this goes against the thinking of many other philosophers, like those in the structuralist tradition, usually hold the subject at arm's length. The reason why, in his eyes at least, is the influence of a kind of scientistic superego, which insists on having all psychological facts made concrete and explainable by outside coordinates. Its influence is problematic for a number of reasons, like in how it ignores the creative side of subjectivity. For Guattari, it's necessary to remove all scientistic references in favour of what he calls an ethico-aesthetic paradigm. As he says concerning psychoanalysis, Besides, are not the best cartographies of the psyche those of Goethe, Proust, Joyce, Artaud, and Beckett rather than Freud, Jung, and Lacan? With this in mind, he adds that there is always a gap between understanding objects and understanding subjects. The only way to connect them is through what he calls a pseudo-narrative detour, basically the creation of a discourse that can relate the two together. This works through what are called ritonelles or refrains, something that I made a short on a while back ago. To expand on what I said there, the Deleuzian scholar Elizabeth Grosch describes them as having three main components, a point of order, a circle of control, and lines of flight. The first are things like myths, rituals, and scientific descriptions that organize the discourse. The second refers to the components implicated in it and the third are linked to the ways in which the situation can be changed. To be a bit more Guattarian about it all, we can say that the circle of control is made up of elements from an incorporeal universe, the second of the four functors we introduced last time. Essentially, this refers to a nebula of possible elements that can be realized in existential territories, the results of a ritonelle. To give an example from Proust, the taste of a Madeleine the narrator eats in Swan's way acts as a point of control, it takes an incorporeal universe of possible feelings, desires, and so on, and coalesces it into the existential territory of Combray in his mind. Returning to the three ecologies, a peculiar feature of these ritonelles is that they function through their rhythmic repetition. The retelling of a myth, for example. They stabilize the territories and universes they generate through redundancies. It's in this way that the discourse a given ritonelle creates has, at its heart, a non-discursive core a place where the division between content and expression falls away as it were. Moving on now to his critique of psychoanalysis, Quattari argues that Freudianism itself has become a model of subjectification based on such redundancies, acting as a template on which sexuality, childhood and neurosis is understood and constructed. In this way, it has become responsible for a kind of standardization of behavior, one of the main topics of our last video. Yet, as he says, I do not at present envisage going beyond Freudianism or breaking definitively with it. However, I do want to reorient Freud's concepts and practices so as to use them differently. 
In particular, Guattari wants to break out of Freudianism's focus on individual subjectivity, which he sees as too simplistic. Guattari, must be remembered, was an influential proponent of the institutional psychotherapy movement after all, whose whole purpose was to deal with group subjectivities. Additionally, he essentially politicizes analysis by arguing it must always be turned towards the future, rather than fixated in the past. This connects closely to what he means by an ethico-aesthetic paradigm. In his eyes, it's ethically untenable for psychiatrists, along with those working in fields like education and the media, to ignore their role in the development of subjectivity. When it comes to the aesthetic side, he stresses it to underline that constant renewal and self-critique is necessary for any field, especially psychoanalysis. Revivals like schizoanalysis, for example, must acknowledge that subjectivities are never just restrained to one domain. One isn't simply a subject around the couch, as it were. Instead, what he calls analytic autographies must account for the whole universes that existential territories are just partial realizations of. Subjectivity is a fluid, constantly changing thing, and is thus impossible to rely solely on established, totalizing theoretical principles. In this way, Quattori calls for an organic praxis, one that is always open to change and evolution, never slowing down long enough to become ossified like many other branches of psychoanalysis. It's at this point that he properly introduces the three ecologies. Here we are talking about a reconstruction of social and individual practices, which I shall classify under three complementary headings, all of which come under the ethico-aesthetic aegis of an ecosophy. Examining them all together, he says that pollution itself isn't the sole threat to the ecologies. Rather, the ways individuals and governments accept it, and similar issues either as incomprehensible or just how it is, are even more dangerous. Here, Guattari's critique of structuralism and postmodernism comes to the forefront. In his eyes, they essentially drain the significance of human intervention. At this point, he turns his attention towards the double bind we seem to find ourselves in. On the one hand, more and more problems are popping up as the rapid transformations of our era and the backlash they have provoked meet the limits of our techno-scientific capabilities. On the other hand, it's impossible to go backwards. Data processing, the interconnectedness of urban centers, the globalization of markets, etc., have had an irreversible effect. Quattri underlines once again the fact that nature can no longer be separated from culture. The two have become inextricably linked. Here, he slips into his polemic side. Just as monstrous and mutant algae invade the lagoon of Venice, so our television screens are populated, saturated by degenerate images and statements. His example in social ecology is men like Donald Trump, which, like invasive algae, colonize whole districts of New York, redeveloping just to condemn thousands to homelessness. The same thing is seen in the way large sections of the Third World have been essentially disassembled, something that, as Guattari writes, simultaneously affects the cultural texture of its populations, its habitat, its immune systems, climate, etc. The question that he poses now is how to deal with such an autodestructive situation. To take a step back, by autodestruction, he is referring to a very specific feature of integrated world capitalism, the system that has come to the forefront in our post-industrial era. Essentially, Quattari sees it as blindly expanding in a way that has become untethered from individual people or groups, something that is harmful to itself in the long run due to the limited resources it must feed upon. To navigate the problems posed by integrated world capitalism, Quattari says they must dispose of pseudoscientific paradigms. Instead, we have to acknowledge the fact that the three ecologies function according to a logic completely different from so-called ordinary communication. To borrow his words, Ecologic is a logic of intensities of autoreferential existential assemblages engaging in irreversible durations. It is the logic not only of human subjects, but also of psychoanalytic partial objects. I know this sounds quite impenetrable, but to break it down, Guattari is essentially describing the idea of subjectivity being processual that we touched on earlier. As far as I can tell, intensities here come from Deleuze's ontology, where they basically refer to the forces that drive processes. For example, the intensities that drive hurricanes are things like pressure and temperature, when it comes to subjectivity, this might take the form of semiotic flows, as can be seen in the streams of information released by the media. Moving on to his idea of autoreferential existential assemblages, 
Pottery is essentially describing what the Chilean biologists Humberto Maturana and Francisco Varela call autopoiesis, the way in which certain systems are able to construct themselves in a self-contained manner. Before looking at what this means for Guattari himself, the most common example of an autopoietic system is the biological cell. As can be seen in this diagram, cells are composed of a myriad of biochemical components that are binded into structures like nuclei, organelles, and cytoskeletons. In turn, these structures produce those components, hence creating a cycle of self-maintenance and production, what Guattari terms an autoreferential assemblage. Returning to the three ecologies itself, this notion of autopoiesis also applies to subjectivity. If you remember from earlier, both existential territories and incorporeal universes depend on non-discursive ritonelles that function through their own redundancies. It's in this way that ecologic is both autopoietic and processual, organized according to the dynamics of intensities and the redundancies of ritonelles. To focus now on the last part of the quote, the idea that ecologic doesn't just care about humans, but also psychoanalytic partial objects, it's important to remember that subjectivity under ecosophy is much more complex and blurry than under that of ordinary communication. As I said earlier, we must think not of totalized individual subjects, but rather of components of subjectification. For him, ecological praxis involve exploring these components and engaging with them in unique, singularizing ways. Guattari uses the term counter-repetition, invoking Rittenels and the idea that the creation of new ones can attach subjectifying vectors from their denotative and signifying functions. In other words, it's possible to disassemble, or to use Guattari's jargon, deterritorialize existing existential territories, and use their components in ways distinct from their original intention. However, as he warns, There is the possibility of a violent deterritorialization which would destroy the assemblage of subjectification, as was the case in Italy in the 1980s with the implosion of the social movement. Ecological praxis therefore need to find a balance between being radical and being gentle. At their heart is what Guattari terms an asignifying rupture, which simply refers to the creation of new incorporeal universes through the development of ritonelles. In his eyes, it's thus that they act as catalysts for subjectification. Everywhere an existential territory exists, there is a ritonelle implicated. It's at this point that Guattari takes a step back to say that we are witnessing an unprecedented erosion of traditional means of social control. To cope with this, there has been a massive uptick in reactionary thinking, focused on, often artificially, returning to the past in some way or another. This isn't only because of an increase in social repression, rather, as Guattari himself puts it, It stems equally from a kind of existential contraction involving all of the actors in the socius. The rise of subjective conservatism, as he calls it, is essentially a response to the extreme transformations associated with the current era. In his eyes, integrated world capitalism is an important actor in this operation, moving away from the production of goods as such and towards a kind of semiotic production. This, through things like the media, advertising, etc., has a major influence on the development of subjectivity. To expound this, Quattri says that our post-industrial capitalism makes use of four instruments – economic, judicial, technoscientific, and subjectifying semiotics. To go one by one, the first refers to the ways it organizes finance, accounting, decision-making, and so on. Basically, the methods integrated world capitalism employs to control the markets. The second instrument, judicial semiotics, deals both with literal courts and regulation on a wider scale. In other words, how representation is used to differentiate between right and wrong good and bad, in such a way that the power of integrated world capitalism is maintained. To understand the third set of semiotics, those that are techno-scientific, I feel a quick detour through Jacques Lacan might help. Essentially, the French psychoanalyst saw what he called the university discourse as a tool used to create something of a scientific hegemony, one that is used by capitalism to justify its own existence. To borrow from my series on Bruce Fink's book The Lacanian Subject, the university discourse acts almost to legitimize the master's will, that's to say, the will of a capitalist system. Here, what is explored is surplus value. The discourse acts to justify and rationalize it, producing in the process alienation. As Fink writes, Working in the service of the master signifier, more or less any kind of argument will do 
as long as it takes on the guise of reason and rationality. Returning to techno-scientific semiotics, this is basically how they're used by integrated world capitalism. Composed of research, studies, diagrams, and so on, they act to order subjectivity under the system. With this, we get to the last of the four instruments, semiotics or subjectification. These, in many ways, overlap with the other three. However, they also act as something of a casual term, which contains things like architecture, town planning, and public facilities. The main takeaway that Guattari wants us to understand is that these tools are not related to each other in a causal relationship. Economic semiotics don't produce judicial semiotics, which in turn don't produce techno-scientific ones. Instead, they're more like Aristotle's four causes than anything else. That's to say, they're essentially a set of interrelated dimensions that all play different roles in phenomena under capitalism, like a 4D axis, so to speak. Breaking with mainstream Marxism, Quattri argues that under the regime of integrated world capitalism, there's no firm base superstructure division, with the former shaping the latter. Instead, there's a complex web of overlapping and intermingling relations between the different semiotic mechanisms. Focusing now on social ecology, Quattri says that praxis built around it must focus on rebuilding human relations at every level of a socius. It's necessary to always keep in mind the fact that capitalism has become delocalized and deterritorialized penetrating even the most unconscious levels of subjectivity. It's here that he actually sets out what he means by the capitalist subject. It is engendered through operators of all types and sizes and is manufactured to protect existence from any intrusion of events that might disturb or disrupt public opinion. In other words, it's designed to be as inoffensive to the status quo as possible. Integrated world capitalism functions through the neutralization of singularity by crushing the greatest number of existential returnals as possible. Singularity here referring to subjectivities that are self-determining and self-regulating. In other words, autopoietic. To break out of this, it's thought that an ecosophical praxis must function on multiple heterogeneous levels. However, it's important not to homogenize them under one molar banner, losing the trees in the forest as it were. Instead, Guattari calls for an activism based in heterogenesis a constant process of singularization. In his words, Ways should be found to enable the singular, the exceptional, the rare, to coexist with a state structure that is the least burdensome possible. Ending the section, Guattari states that environmental ecology, as it existed in his time, was unable to account for the kind of general ecology that he's laying out in this essay. It's not enough to just focus on specific issues without questioning what gives rise to them. At the end of the day, as he says, Ecology, in my sense, questions the whole of subjectivity and capitalistic power formations, whose sweeping progress cannot be guaranteed to continue as it has for the last decade. It's with this that Guattari concludes this section of the three ecologies. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better. Next time, we'll finish the essay and explore the principles that govern the ecologies. Until then, bye!